this time of year in, in late June and early July, there are several very beautiful feasts that we celebrate. We have the octaves of Corpus Christi and the Sacred Heart, usually in early June. They're movable, though. And then St. John the Baptist and Saints Peter and Paul and the Precious Blood in the Feast of the Visitation. And it seems like almost every day for a couple of weeks we're celebrating either a great feast day or a day within the octave of some great feast. So there's so much to choose from, it's hard to know what to talk about in a sermon. But this Sunday, I thought I would talk about one of the greatest of these feasts that we've celebrated recently, which is the Feast of the Precious Blood on July 1st. Now, when we think of the precious blood of Jesus, we think about his passion and death and his sufferings on the cross. We think about his side being pierced and so on. His blood saturated all of his clothing. What little was left after the soldiers stripped it away. His precious blood covered the scourges. It covered the cross and the, the streets of Jerusalem. We think also of the, the great price that was paid for our redemption. We think about how our Lord shed every single drop of blood in his body out of love for us. All of these are, are very beautiful thoughts and they they inflame us with love of our blessed Lord. But I wanted to focus on a different aspect of this, this devotion today, one that we don't think about nearly as much. But if you think about it, we have much closer contact with the precious blood of our Lord than we realize. We shouldn't think of it as his blood that was shed 2,000 years ago, and that's it. Actually, the precious blood is, is shed in a, in a mystical manner in the holy sacrifice of the Mass every time it is offered. Now, it's important to remember that our Lord's blood is not shed in Mass in the same way that it was shed on Calvary, because our Lord died only once. And the Mass simply makes present his death, and it presents it again to God the Father in propitiation for our sins. But nevertheless, his precious blood is right there in the chalice at every single Mass. This is something that the Church treasures very highly, and it treats with the greatest possible care and holiness. The Church has many rules about, about the chalice, what it's supposed to look like, how it's supposed to be made. The chalice that is used in Mass is supposed to be made completely out of either silver or gold. Although, if a church can't afford such a thing, that would be very expensive. The stem can be made out of a, a base metal, but the cup at the top that holds our Lord's blood is absolutely required to be made out of solid silver. And not only that, it is absolutely required that the inside where the, the precious blood touches has to be completely plated with gold. Before a chalice can be used, it has to be consecrated by a bishop who, in the course of the consecration, anoints the entire inside of the chalice with holy chrism. And after it's consecrated, as I remember from the seminary, excuse me, it can't be touched by a lay person. It can only be touched by someone, at least in minor orders. The chalice should make us think of the Sacred Heart of Jesus because of the, the beautiful and mysterious connection that each chalice has with the Sacred Heart from which the precious blood flows into the chalice in Mass each day. And like an inexhaustible river, the glorious price of our redemption overflows into the chalice of every priest every day throughout the whole world renewing again the work of our salvation every day by offering the propitiation to God for our sins and earning the actual graces that sinners everywhere need to repent. Now, in the Mass, the chalice is presented to God in the offertory with a beautiful prayer. After the priest pours in the water, I'm sorry, the wine mixed with a drop or two of water, he takes the chalice to the middle of the altar and he holds it in his hands like this. He holds it up to God and he offers the chalice with the words, 
in Latin, of course, we offer unto thee, O Lord, the chalice of salvation, beseeching thy clemency that it may rise up in thy sight with an odor of sweetness for our salvation and for that of the whole world. Amen. And the rubrics tell him to have his eyes raised towards heaven while he says that because he's talking to God. What does it mean, an odor of sweetness? That's a term from the Old Testament when sacrifices to God were usually burned, which generated smoke that that rose towards God, along with, of course, uh, incense that was also used. And God would frequently talk in the Old Testament about the odor being sweet or, or sometimes otherwise, depending on the dispositions of the person offering the sacrifice. You may remember that that Cain and Abel both offered sacrifice to God, but it was only the sacrifice of Abel that rose up before God with an odor of sweetness, because he was the only one that offered his sacrifice with love of God, and his sacrifice was a symbol of his interior service and adoration. While Cain did not love God, and his sacrifice was something meaningless and even hypocritical to Cain. That's something for us to remember, too, that our presence at Mass and our offering of the sacrifice through the priest will only be pleasing if it, if it represents our interior dispositions, if, if it is accompanied by service and adoration on our part. Now, those of you who read your missiles carefully might notice a slight discrepancy between the, the prayer of offering the host and the prayer for the chalice. When the, the priest offers the host, he says, I, thy unworthy servant, offer this, this host. I'm quoting a little bit loosely here. Whereas with the chalice, he says, we offer, and so on. The two are not that much different, but actually there is a symbolic reason why he says two slightly different things, and it has to do with the water that is mixed into the chalice. The water is symbolic of the human race. Of course, the wine represents Christ, and and very soon it will more than represent Christ. It will be completely changed into him at the consecration. But the drops of water that are added to the chalice represent the human race, a simple and and basic element that becomes mixed into and incorporated with the noble liquid of wine. A chemist will tell you that wine is mostly composed of water, so if you add a tiny amount of water to wine, we're talking about just a couple of drops um, mixed into about an ounce or two of wine that's in the chalice at the offertory, The water is basically changed into wine as it mixes into it or is dissolved in it. It doesn't say this in scripture, but there is a very strong tradition that our Lord mixed water into the chalice at the Last Supper, just like we do at Mass, which is why the Church continues this in the Mass. And this this symbolizes the fact that we are supposed to be incorporated into the mystical body of Christ and offered along with him to God. And just as our Lord offered his whole life to God to do his will, even to the shedding of of all of his precious blood, so we are supposed to do the same thing along with Christ, as though we were mixed into him like, like the water mixed into the wine, and we are supposed to be immolated along with him. And what this means in practice is that we are supposed to offer our entire self, our entire being, to serve God in whatever way he wants, and to lose our will in his will, and offer it completely to him. This is the meaning of the water mixed into the wine. Note that beautiful phrase in the offering of the chalice, that we offer it for our salvation and for that of the whole world. The Mass in the first place, is a means of salvation for, for the members of the church, primarily, who receive the most graces from the Mass. But even non-Catholics receive graces from the holy sacrifice of the Mass, so that they be converted and, and be saved. 
The mass covers the whole earth with grace, just like the rays of the sun. It's something that everybody benefits from. And it is only thanks to the mass that the world has not already long ago drowned in the wrath of God for all of its sins, because in the mass every day there is offered to God an atonement for the sins of mankind. Now let us skip ahead to the the consecration of the chalice. The Missal uses an interesting expression to describe what happens here. It says, Our Lord took this excellent chalice in his hands, right before the words of consecration. The chalice here is not the same physical chalice that our Lord used at the Last Supper, obviously, but it is the same in the sense that it is filled with wine intended for exactly the same purpose. But as soon as the words of consecration are spoken, then what it contains is exactly, and in the most literal sense, the same as what our Lord had in his hands at the Last Supper, when it contains his precious blood. Now that expression, excellent chalice, there's not an exact equivalent in English, so excellent chalice is the best translation we can, we can come up with. That is not chosen at random. That's actually a quote from Psalm 22, the famous psalm that, that Protestants like to quote at funerals that starts with the words, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In this beautiful psalm, King David expresses his, his trust and the protection of God no matter what dangers might be around him. And he closes the psalm with a short image of God setting a table for him to eat and and taking care of him. And one of the things that he mentions is how excellent is the cup of wine that he is drinking because it is prepared for him by God and is a symbol of God's mercy and love towards him. That is where that, that phrase is taken in the Mass. So it is a fitting descriptor of of the chalice in the Mass, because that also is is prepared for us by God, and it is filled with our Lord's precious blood in order to communicate to us God's mercy on our behalf. And after these words, the priest bows low over the chalice until his mouth is almost at the level of, of the rim. This breath creates a layer of condensation on the gold that lines the inside of of the sacred cup. And it repeats again the words of our Lord. Those beautiful words which were so sacrilegiously changed and corrupted by the heretics of our times. And he has no sooner finished the last word of consecration than he holds in his hands the exact same precious blood which was poured out for our sins 2,000 years ago. And in the very next words, as often as you shall do these things, in memory of me shall you do them. He quotes again the promise and the gift and the commandment that our Lord gave us, by which he gave us the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the priesthood that, that continues it. The sacrifice of the Mass is a very deep mystery that that no human mind can fathom. But I want to close today with a quote from from Father Nikolaus Gier, who wrote one of the most complete works on the Mass of of recent times, called The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And he gives a magnificent and profound explanation of what the Mass is. Now, I know this has been a long, boring sermon, and this quote is going to be a little bit long, but please give me just one more minute of your attention and try to listen to these beautiful words. Father Gear says, The twofold consecration, meaning of the bread and the wine, is a mystical shedding of blood and places before our eyes in a most lively manner the bloody death of Christ sacrificed on the cross. The sacrifice on the altar is indeed painless, for the Savior is no longer passable and can no longer suffer death. But his divinely human heart is here inflamed with the same love of sacrifice and is moved by the same obedience 
of his father to sacrifice himself as when he was on the cross. The love, this love and this obedience urged him to sacrifice himself mystically on the altar also under the twofold sacramental appearances. It is at the moment of consecration that the sacrifice is accomplished, is offered to God and placed in the hands of us poor mortals. This entire act of consecration is performed so quietly and so mysteriously that no one perceives anything of the wonderful transformation wrought by the priest's words on the host and in the chalice. Some words softly pronounced by the mouth of the priest and the essence of the bread and wine have disappeared. Their place is taken by Christ's body and blood, the whole Christ, the victim of Golgotha. For the senses alone, nothing has happened. Nothing is changed. For the appearances of bread and wine, upheld by the power of God, have remained to serve as a veil and a covering for the bright majesty of the King of glory, who with us and for us is present as the victim on the altar. To fathom the height and depth of the Eucharistic consecration is beyond the wisdom of the cherubim, Truly, no moment commands greater reverence. No moment is more holy or more beneficial than that in which the Eucharistic sacrifice is accomplished and the altar becomes a mystical Mount Calvary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.